Hi, welcome everybody. Thanks uh, so much uh, for coming. My name is uh, Mike Place. Uh, as you can tell, uh, I am a long way from home. I am from Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I am the uh, principal maintainer of the SaltStack project. I have been for about five years now. Uh, Tom, uh, SaltStack was originally uh, written by my boss, uh, whose name is Tom Hatch, who maybe some of you know. And uh, the stuff that I get really, really passionate and really, really excited about uh, is automation and configuration management and figuring out how to control uh, infrastructure at uh, really, really large and, and hyperscale. Uh, and so I get uh, really, really happy when I can come here and talk about uh, automation and about SALT uh, and about the stuff that, uh, that, that I'm really interested in. So yeah, that's me. And uh, like I said, uh, I am uh, the principal maintainer of SALT. Uh, if there's anybody here who has ever participated in the SALT uh, project, uh, I might be the guy who was reviewing your PRs. So hopefully I was really nice to you. And if I wasn't, uh, please come up to me afterwards and I'll apologize to you. But uh, SALT is one of the uh, largest and most active Python-based uh, open source projects in the world. Uh, on a typical day uh, in SALT, we'll wake up on a Monday uh, and we'll review and merge somewhere between 20 and 30 pull requests, which will constitute anywhere between a thou uh, about 1,000 and maybe 5,000 lines uh, of code. So uh, we have weeks where we uh, move, as, move around around as many as 30 or 40,000 lines of code. So SALT in many ways is as large and as active as major operating systems. And I think that's one of the ways that you have to start to think about the way infrastructure is changing, is that the notion of the, the operating system itself is moving up and up, and abstraction is moving up and up away from the hardware as we start to build out more distributed uh, systems. And automation is a, real, uh, is a key component of that. Uh, assumably, there are a number of people here who use uh, SUSE. For those of you uh, familiar with uh, SUSE Manager, uh, SALT is the technology that is right under the hood there. Uh, we're very thankful to our, to our friends at SUSE. Uh, and uh, we have collaboration you know, with, uh, with a number of other people. So let's talk about uh, SALT itself. These, are, uh, these sort of introductory talks are always a little bit difficult for me to give because it's a little bit like saying, well, uh, explain tumble, all of Tumbleweed to me in 30 minutes. OK, go. <laughs> and you're like, well, where do I even start? Uh, but at the end of the day, SALT is a automation framework that is designed to allow you to contr uh, control your infrastructure by implementing automation patterns. OK, so what do I mean by that? So in 2011, uh, Tom and then very soon myself set out to solve a really simple problem. What we wanted to do is we had these large infrastructures that we had to control. And we needed to do something really, really basic, which is that we needed to send shell commands to a lot of machines. And by a lot, I mean thousands, which in 2011, was a lot. It's not really a lot anymore. But at the time, we had to we had to send a series of shell commands, you know, to two or three thousand machines at the same time. So we're like, well, okay, what are we going to do there? Uh, and so what we wanted to do is build a really really fast uh, remote execution framework. Right? We're all familiar with the notion of remote execution. Right? We started all the way back in the day with RSH. Uh, but basically, we wanted to run shell commands, commands, and we want to wanted to run them in a massively parallel way. So SALT started out as a command and control system, wherein you could have what we call a master, which is uh, a management node. Uh, and you could have machines which were under control uh, or being managed. Uh, we call those minions. And that works in a client-server architecture, uh, such that uh, from the master, you can publish a command to a series of minions. The minions will run the command, and they'll return the results back to the master. 
So the way that uh, we ended up making this really, really fast is that uh, we took uh, a technology off the shelf called ZeroMQ, right? uh, which these days is still around, still an amazing proje product, or project, rather. Uh, and uh, there are a number of other message buses around uh, as well. Uh, but ZeroMQ gave us uh, the flexibility to be able to publish these commands simultaneously in a PubSub pattern uh, in a number of milliseconds, almost as fast as the network round trip time would be, uh, along with uh, encryption overhead and a few other things. So after that point, we said, OK, cool. Now we can control our data center basically by you know, typing commands on a single machine. Uh, what should we do next? And the service that came along next was configuration management, which we're all familiar with, right? Our friends uh, at CF Engine and our friends at Chef and our friends at Puppet uh, have been talking about this notion of infrastructure as code for a really, really long time. And so we said, OK, that's cool. We'll do that. Uh, and there were a couple of problems that we wanted to address that were in that ecosystem. And I'm going to talk about them really briefly before I get into the nuts and bolts, just because I'm a huge nerd about this stuff and I really like to talk about the history and the philosophy. So. One of the big debates that was happening at the time, uh, especially in the configuration management world, was this debate between imperative, an imperative approach and a declarative approach. Now, if you remember back to your computer science classes, you have the notion of imperative programming and declarative programming. But from a systems management perspective, uh, an imperative approach is what you might think of as a procedural approach. It says, OK, in order to get the system to state Z, first do step A, then do step B, then do step C, then do step C, so on and so on and so on and so on. And that's how you get the system to, to, to this final state. And that gives you, of course, maximal control and for you know, people who are very into programming like that sort of thing. Uh, but it's also not particular. It's it, it can be brittle, right? Because what happens if state D one day needs to change for one reason or another? That's a huge pain, right? Um, the second approach is a declarative approach. A declarative approach uh, says, okay, I want to get this, the system to state Z. In order to do that, I am simply going to describe state Z, and I am going to allow the internal mechanics uh, of whatever system, be it a compiler or an automation engine or whatever it is, figure out the best way to get me from A to Z, right? Uh, and so there was this huge debate, and um, Products like Chef, or, or I should say projects, projects like Chef, projects like Puppet, really ended up um, somewhat more on the imperative side of this, right? They came up with domain-specific languages in order to describe systems. Chef, if you've ever used that, is a, is a really imperative approach. Um, and we said, well, you know what? I think we might be able to do both of those things. And so we set out uh, trying to achieve that goal of creating a system, um, a project where you could both uh, sort of program in an imperative sense how the system could look, but also describe in a declarative sense if, if that's what you wanted to do. So we built out configuration management, and we'll take a look at how that looks uh, in a bit here. But um, the configuration management approach that we took uh, was to use uh, a serialization language uh, called YAML that probably a lot of you are familiar with these days. Uh, but YAML allows you to, in a very sort of declarative way, say, OK, I want this declaration about the state of my system, which the declaration might be, OK, uh, make sure that the uh, Apache package is installed, right? And your configuration management system does that by figuring out whether it needs to to invoke uh, dpackage or zipper or yum or whatever it is, so on and so forth. So um, let's go on and uh, let's talk about how Salt actually implements this client server architecture so that we can control all of these minions or these managed nodes uh, at really, really high speed. Which brings me to the second big debate that you hear a lot about in the automation space these days. And that debate uh, is uh, about uh, whether it's better to have an agent-based approach, i.e. to have an agent that sits on all of these managed nodes that listens to commands, or whether it's better to have an agentless approach. The advocates of an agentless approach uh, basically run all of their commands uh, over SSH, right? 
Well, we said, again, that sort of seems like a false dichotomy. We're going to allow you to do both. If you want an agentless approach, SALT will do that. Uh, it will control, uh, command and control all of your minions uh, with no uh, software installed on the other end, just an SSH uh, daemon listening. Uh, or we have an agent-based approach. The agent-based approach, like I said, runs over 0MQ and is very, very, very fast. So um, the master that sits on top right, uh, connects to all of these different types of machines over what we call a message bus. Now, we think that the, uh, the SALT uh, message bus, we also call it an event bus, is an extremely powerful paradigm for infrastructure management. And the reason that we think so is because uh, a single event bus that acts as a management layer between your manage manager node, right? We call it the master, and your minions um, that events flow over allows more than just your management layer to participate in the administration of your network. Which is to say that, for example, right now, a really common paradigm is you'll have a monitoring system that sits over here, and you'll have a management system that sits over here, and those are in very specific silos. Well, one of the things that we said is, why does that need to be the case, right? Why can't it, we have machines that, uh, uh, emit events about their own health, right, that go on to this uh, event bus, and why don't we have an automation system that can listen to those events, and if it hears about a problem, hey, turns out it's a configuration management system. It can go out and fix them. So um, that's called, uh, we call that the uh, event system or the salt reactor, and we'll look at uh, some demos of those really quick. Okay, so continuing on with uh, how we've implemented all of these ideas, there are a couple of uh, main principles when you start to get into SALT and you start to look uh, at, at using SALT for your own projects that you'll probably want to be familiar with. Uh, so we've split those up into two areas. The first is on the master side. Again, the master is this management node. And the master has a couple of concepts uh, that you'll really want to understand. Uh, the first is what we call the pillar on the master side. The pillar is simply a place where we store secrets that a managed node might need to know about. So why do we need to do this? Because, for example, uh, one of the things that people very frequently do when they're managing systems is they write out configuration files, and sometimes those configuration files have secrets in them, right? So let's imagine, for example, that uh, you want to use Salt to control a fleet of MySQL servers, okay? So you need to write out etsy, you know, my.conf to all of these machines, uh, but inside my.conf, right, you're going to have, you know, stuff like connection passwords things of that nature. Uh, but you're also controlling some uh, Apache web servers, right? But you don't want them to have access to that. So what the pillar does is it allows you to specify this password that you're going to templatize into your configuration files on the MySQL side, deliver those files securely uh, to those machines, uh, but not uh, have that secret available uh, to other machines. Uh, the second... Uh, I think really important principle to understand about the master is this notion of the reactor. And don't worry if this is a little bit abstract because in just a minute or two we'll start to get into some demos and look at some code so things won't be so confusing. But the reactor is this idea that on the master side, remember again that we have this event bus, right, where masters are publishing events and minions are listening to those events and uh, sending back returns. So we might say, for example, okay, all minions, uh, tell me what version of Python you have installed, right? Uh, and they all get busy doing that and they send all these returns back to the master. Each of those returns, or rather each event on this bus, has both a tag and a data structure. Now, what we can do with this is that we can actually configure the master so that it can listen for certain types of events, and then it can react to those events accordingly, right? So it might say, for example, okay, tell me about the version of Python, right? And any, you know, any, uh, react, uh, any event that comes back, right, that says Python 2.6, 
right? Then the master says, ah, that's a problem, right? I'm going to react to that by telling that minion to go out uh, and upgrade to Python 3 or whatever it is, right? So as we write, we write we can create this reactive infrastructure, right? And we can program against that in, I think, a much more compelling way than in like the typical procedural way of trying to, you know, create APIs between services uh, and trying to sort of procedurally, right, write out how all of that will look. Anyway, we'll look at that uh, in depth in just a minute here. Uh, on the minion side, uh, there are three concepts that are really important for your first day uh, working with salt. The first of those is grains. Uh, a grain in the salt ecosystem is simply a fact about a machine, right? The OS, the IP address, you can assign arbitrary facts to a system, right, that are grains. And what those grains allow you to do is, from the master, uh, target machines intelligently. Right. So, for example, you could have all of your machines in data center one have a grain that says DC one. And then when you want to upgrade all of your machines at DC one, it's simple as saying, OK, salt, target everything with the grain DC one and do a package upgrade of this package. And in a single command, right, your fleet of a thousand machines has done its package upgrade and you can go off to lunch. Easy as that. The second and perhaps most critical uh, component or set of components on the minion is called a module, right? Uh, modules are what do the work. They are what is called uh, by SALT. Now, what we wanted to do when we created SALT, SALT, as I've mentioned, is written in Python, is that we wanted SALT to mirror Python, the way people interact with Python and be as Pythonic as it could possibly be. And so modules themselves are actually literally Python modules, right? If you're not a Python programmer, when I say module, I basically mean a Python script, right? Or a file written in Python. Uh, and these Python modules simply have a set of functions which are inside them, right? Uh, which so you might have, for example, a package module, and one of those functions might be a function l literally just called install, right? And so as you can see here in the middle, putting all of these concepts together, this is the, um, the, basically the salt uh, command line here. Uh, and this would say salt star, right? So we're using basically shell globbing, right? Um, run module.function, which corresponds to the module name and the Python function that is inside it, and then any arguments that you wish to pass to this Python function. That goes and that runs over the message bus, uh, and then you are off to the races. So, like I said, there are three main components of SALT. The first is remote execution. We talked about that, right? In that model, uh, the minion accepts uh, a request, right? Um, in the uh, in the zero and queue world, which is the agent-based world, uh, these, this is persistent, but we can also do it in an agentless way. Let's move away from the slides just for a moment, so we can get a little bit less abstract and actually look at how all of this works. Can everybody see this? Okay, text size is cool. Bigger? Okay, hang on. Better. More? Okay. Better? Okay. Good. So, um, and you can see the bottom okay, right? Okay. So what I have here is uh, I have on the top, uh, and I'm running this, these both with debug logging, I have the master on the top, and I have the minion on the bottom, okay? And so if I say, for example, right, salt, star, right, test.echo, right, hello, All right, oops, let's not demo fail today, <laughs> we actually did demo fail, that was cool, let's try that again, and where have we gone?
Ah, that's the problem. <laughs> I do know how to use computers, don't worry. Okay, right. Because does anybody know why that happened? It's because like I briefly forgot how shells work. Okay, right. Because the shell, yeah, okay. Cool. Not embarrassing at all. Uh, all right. So there we go. Uh, to illustrate how something like this is mapped into SALT itself, um, I think it's good just to actually, actually let's do this, just to go look at some source code, okay? So if you download SALT, right, this is the directory structure that you'll get, okay? If you go here to modules, this is the list of execution modules, and I just want to show you Okay. Right. Here we go. All right. Echo text. So you can see, hopefully, at this point, how all of these concepts are starting to connect together, right? Because what we did here is we ran salt, and then I targeted the name of the minions that I wanted the command to run on. Then I gave it uh, test.echo, which said, use the test module, and then I said, okay, give it, uh, run the echo uh, function, and then I gave it an argument of hello, and that went straight to here, and in a very Pythonic way, we just ingested uh, the argument, and we returned it. So if, you're, uh, if you do any programming at all, or any system administration at all, especially if it's in Python, this should start to get really, really exciting for you, because you should be able to say at this point, you know what? I can manage all of my systems like this because all I have to do is write a little bit of Python, write a single execution module to do the work that I want to do, just drop it in everywhere, and I'm done, right? Which I personally think is really, really neat. So let's jump back here. Okay. So next we have the concept of configuration management. So let's look at uh, how that works in the SALT ecosystem here. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up some terminal windows here. OK. So um, again, configuration management, if you don't know, is the uh, uses a fancy word right, called uh, item potency, right? which simply means that when we tell a machine uh, that we want it to be configured in some way, the Configuration management system will go, oh, OK, no problem. Um, first, I'm going to check to see if the machine is configured in that way. If it is, I will do nothing. If it is not, then I will figure out what needs to be done. Then I will do it. Then I will tell you what I did. And then if you tell me to do it again, I won't do it again because I did it the first time. Right? So. The way that um, we create those intended states um, is by writing what we call SLS files. So let's go look at some. Okay. Okay. Let's start out with, uh, as you can see, these are just written in YAML, right? Uh, let me give you a really brief tour of YAML because for people who are not familiar with YAML or uh, can find this a little bit daunting, the important thing here is that uh, YAML is really just dictionaries and lists, right? So if you've dealt with dictionaries and lists at all, YAML, I can explain YAML to you in 30 seconds. So here's my attempt to do that. If you see a colon in YAML, you are looking at a dictionary, okay? Where the thing on the left side of the colon is the key, and the thing on the right side of the colon uh, is the value. If you are, if you see a dash, you are looking at a list, all right? If you see something like this, all right, where you see a dash and a colon, then you are looking at a list of dictionaries. Okay, that's YAML in 30 seconds. Right. Uh, the very last thing is that uh, indentation matters in YAML. Salt uses a subset of the full YAML uh, specification. Thank goodness. Um, and um, 
so if you, if you want to express that something is a set of something else, uh, you simply indent again. All right. So YAML took me like 45 seconds, but not too bad. So uh, in salt, right, to write out a state, we start out with a top level key that is simply arbitrary text that describes the state itself. Here I've called this one, write out a secret file. OK? The second line, right, or the value for that top level key is the state that we wish to run. OK? So when I say that, right, first, oops, sorry. OK? We saw here, right, that we had this list of modules, these execution modules that can do remote execution. We also have states. And each one of these states interact with the configuration management system. Okay. And uh, they can, well, configure the state of a system, right? And I got lost. There we go. Okay. So the state that um, I want to do here is I want to use a state that ships with salt, which is called file.managed, right? Exactly the same syntax. If you looked in the states directory, you would see a state called file, and you would see a uh, function called managed. And that function would take a couple of arguments. One of those would be the source of the file that we want to write out to our machines. Uh, the second one would be the name, where we want to write it to. And of course, this is all documented both in the public documentation and in the source code for the state itself. The third thing uh, is uh, something that we want to point out, which is that uh, SALT, both in its states and in files that it can write out, uh, supports uh, templating through a bunch of different templating languages. But the most common one is called uh, Jinja. If you know, if you've ever been a Django programmer, you know all about Jinja, right? OK, so this should make sense. What this says is, OK, this state says we're going to write out something that is templatized. The template is going to be stored on the master in uh, this location called secret file. And the place that we want to write it out to is going to be slash temp slash foo. So the next thing we should do is go, OK, well, let's look at what's in secret file, all right? OK. Here it is. Okay, the secret is going is now. This looks kind of weird, but all this is is a, a little bit of Jinja again, some templatization, uh, and this says pillar dot get. Remember, we described the pillar. The pillar was this key, secrets key value store that was on the master, right? This again should look very Pythonic to you. Pillar dot get the value for the key foo. So when we templatize this file, when we write it out, imagine this was a configuration file or what have you, um, then we would write out uh, whatever the secret is for the key foo. So the last piece of this mystery right, uh, is what's in the pillar. All right. Okay. What's in this pillar here? I skipped over, I glossed over some of that, but we're a little bit limited on time, so that's the only reason why. Uh, Foo bar, right? Okay. So let's see. Okay. So this is called demo, right? As you recall. So let's, oops, go over here. And what we're going to, the remote execution command we're going to run in this case is called state.sls. Right. This is perhaps the most confusing part for people who are starting with Salt their first day. Uh, but state is an execution module, right? Um, because all calls via the Salt command line are two execution modules. This one is called state. The function is called SLS, uh, and what we pass to it is the name of the SLS file that we just wrote out. That'll take you two or three times to kind of get in your head, and then it'll make perfect sense. So we're saying, OK, on the machine silver, right, enforce the state called demo, right? So we go ahead and we do that, right? And there we go, really, really quickly, a little under 50 milliseconds, right? Oops. We can see. We could see the return that happened right there, right? Write out a secret file. Uh, the function that we called was file.manage. What we wrote out was temp.foo, right? And there's temp.foo. Okay. So uh, 
that is a really, really basic uh, run through of how the state system operates. As you can see, if you, oops. Okay, I'll make this even bigger here. Well, yeah, maybe I won't. Okay. What I was going to say is, as you can see, there are quite a few states here, right? Um, let's do one, uh, for example, that says, uh, okay, I want to install a package on all of my machines, right? You might look and go, okay, well, I'm just going to use the package state. And. Right. Okay. It, come on. Install demo package. All right. We're going to call the package.install state. And I just happen to know offhand, although you could look in the documentation, right, uh, that uh, it takes an argument called name. All right. So easy as that. And then, okay, whoop, is that not what I called it? I called it package. And there we go. And you can see, right, whoa, package.install is not a, oh, <laughs> because I typoed it. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Right. And there we go. You can see now this is uh, sadly not a Linux machine, but it's going out and it's using brew and it's, it's figuring out how to do that. The nice thing there is if uh, you don't manage a heterogeneous infrastructure uh, and you know three of your machines happen to be um, something other than OpenSUSE, right? Uh, you don't have to figure out the difference. You can just run package.install, and Salt's going to figure out under the hood, how, in a declarative way, how to actually do that package installation for you, right? OK. So as you can see, um, you can actually take this a really, really long way. Um, you can use this to control files on your operating system. You can use it to ensure that services might be running or that they might not be running. You can use it to ensure that things might be installed or not be installed, right? what have you. Because I'm just about out of time, I did want to show you uh, one thing. Can you see that, or is that way too small? Way too small. OK. So I will, <laughs> for those who want to see it, I will show it to you uh, afterwards. There was some SUSE specific stuff, but obviously it's on this VM, and, and it's a little bit too small. So um, with that, that's a very basic run through of what your first steps uh, with SALT might look like in order to uh, run some remote execution commands and uh, to use the configuration management system. If people have specific questions uh, about SALT, I'm happy to, to take those, or I'm happy to demo stuff for people uh, outside in the hallway after we're done. So with that, thanks very much. If there are questions, I'll take those too.